Hey guys, here is the whole of C3 for Edexcel. By the time you get this far in the course, the examiner is going to expect that you can balance equations perfectly. So here is a particularly tricky one for us to practice on. We have aluminium, um, N O A L M N O. We have one, we have one, we have two, we have two, we have one, we have three. So the first thing I'm going to do is put a two in front of there. That gives me two there. Um, now, because I have an of an oxygen, so I have an even number on one side and an odd number on the other side. What I'm going to do is just put a two in front of there, um, just to make my numbers even, because even numbers are much much easier to work with. That gives me a four. That gives me a six, which means I need to change that one there into a four. That gives me four. Um, then I need to get some more oxygen. So let's get rid of that. Let's pop a three in front of there. I have three of those, I have six of those, so let's pop a three in front of there, and I have three of those. If you cannot balance that equation, um, and I know it's a particularly tricky one, but the examiners are going to throw particularly tricky ones at you. So if you can't balance that sort of equation, you need to practice. Um, I suggest you pop over to my website where I've just published a book which includes loads and loads of equations for you to balance. The exam board is going to expect that you know the test for ions and it's not just going to be something as simple as what colour does this go in a flame test, they're probably going to want you to play detective. Now some of these colours might seem a bit unusual but these are the colours that the exam board would like you to call them. So lithium goes crimson, sodium, yellow, potassium is a lovely lilac colour, calcium goes red, notice different from the crimson of lilac, and barium goes green, even though it's basically impossible to see in the lab. The other tests for positive ions that you need to know are the reactions with sodium hydroxide, And you need to know that copper 2 will give a blue precipitate, iron 2 will give a green precipitate and iron 3 will give a brown precipitate. Now this is sometimes hard to see in the lab but don't worry about what you see in the lab because this is what the exam board wants to see. As well as positive ions, you need to know how to test for negative ions. So testing for carbonate is if we add an acid, it should fizz, and then the fizz should be carbon dioxide, which should turn lime water cloudy. Halides, there are three different halides um, that you need to know. First thing we need to do is to add dilute nitric acid. Then we need to add silver nitrate. And chlorine ions will go white. Bromide ions will go cream and iodide ions will go yellow. Again in the lab these colours are very very subtle to see but this is what the exam board would like you to write. The last thing we need to do is to test for sulphate ions. You need to add dilute hydrochloric acid and then barium chloride. And if sulphate ions are present then you will get a white precipitate formed. Water contains a surprising amount of chemistry. So there are two different types of water you need to know about. You need to know about hard water and soft water. Hard water is going to have group two compounds dissolved in it. So that's going to be calcium or magnesium.
and soft auto just doesn't. And the place that it gets these um, group two compounds is when it rains, the water then trickles through limestone rocks and out the other side. So when it's dissolving, when it's going through the rocks, it um, dissolves in there and then that turns the nice soft water into hard water. When the magnesium calcium ions in hard water react with soap, we are going to get scum. That is the stuff that, you know, when you're washing hands, sometimes you can see the foamy stuff. That is the scum. If we heat it up, that is when we're going to get scale. So this is lime scale. Now, hard water might not sound very good, but there are some advantages to it. It is very good for your teeth and bones because it has lots and lots of lovely um, minerals in there, lots and lots of lovely calcium in there. It is also good at preventing heart disease. There are a number of ways we can remove hardness. So we have two types of hard water, temporary hard water and permanent hard water. And temporary hard water can just be um, made soft by heating it. And that is going to lead to lime scale in the bottom of our kettles, which can then um, hurt the way that the kettles work and potentially break them. Permanent hard water cannot be removed just by boiling it. So you have to do two things. You can also do this to um, temporary hard water to remove it. You can use soda. So washing soda or soda crystals, that is going to soften the water. Or you can use an iron exchange column, which will replace the group two ions with something like a group one iron. There are several general equations you need to know. So acid plus metal is going to be a salt and hydrogen. Acid plus base, salt and water. Acid and metal oxide, salt and water. Acid and metal carbonate, salt, water and carbon dioxide. If they ask you about state symbols in the exam, it is time to take note because it means they are probably looking for a gas or a solid being produced. If you add two liquids together, look to see whether one of the products is a solid or a gas because that's the sort of thing they're looking for in the answer. Liquid generally is just going to be water. AQ is aqueous which means something dissolved in water. And there is another one, PPT, which is precipitate, which means it goes cloudy. If you see something after it, which is produced as solid, you can say it goes cloudy. Gas, you are going to get bubbles. They love asking about practicals, not only the rates of reaction practicals, but by making salt. So here we have some hot sulfuric acid. We've added in copper oxide and we've stirred this until the black powder won't dissolve anymore. We need to filter it to get rid of all the black powder. So that'll start up here and we will get a lovely blue solution come down here. Then what we need to do is to evaporate all of the water off so that we end up with the copper sulfate crystals. One of the potential long wordy questions they can ask you is how to do a titration. So in our titration, we are going to have a white tile at the bottom here. This is so we can see any color changes really, really clearly. In our conical flask with a pipette, and we need to get our spellings in this correct because they're going to be looking for that. Um, in the conical flask, we are going to put our alkali with an indicator. Another spelling of a key word up here is burette. And in the burettes, we are going to put our acid. Um, what you're going to do, this is a little tap here is run our acid into the alkali drop by drop until you get to the end point. And what we are looking for is concordant results. 
which have results that are the same to 0 0.1 centimetres cubed. It takes you a while the first time you do it, but once you've done it as many times as I have, you can do it pretty quickly. Titration calculations are the other big maths topic in C3, and these can be really tricky, but the best thing you can do is practice. Now, again, in my book, there's a whole section on loads and loads of titration calculations. So if you're finding these tricky, I suggest you pop over to my website and get the book. In a titration calculation, the first thing we need to do is to check our equation is balanced, because that is gonna tell us how much of stuff reacts with other stuff. So in this reaction, we had 25 centimetre cubed of sodium hydroxide at an unknown concentration, and it took exactly 20 centimetres cubed of 0.5 moles per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid to neutralise it. So the first thing that we need to do is to work out how many moles of our acid we have. So what we need to do is to take the concentration, which is 0 0.5, and because that's decimeter cubed, we need to divide that by a thousand then we can times it by 20 because that is how much we actually use which is going to give us a concentration of 0 0.010 moles of acid used. Now in this reaction they react in a one-to-one -one ratio so if we have used 0 0.01 moles of acid we are going to have used 0 0.01 moles of sodium hydroxide and we did this in 25 centimeters cubed so we can divide that by 25 then we can take our answer and times it by a thousand so that we can get it into a decimeters cubed which is going to give us a final concentration of 0 0.40 moles per decimeter cubed once you've had a lot of practice these will just come really really naturally on the pH scale, 1 is something that is very acidic and 14 that is something that is very alkali. Now acidity comes from hydrogen ions and alkalinity comes from hydroxide ions. And what we get is hydrogen ions plus hydroxide ions turn into water, which is neutral. Now this comes up a lot, so you should definitely learn that equation. It's lovely, it's simple, you should learn it. In electrolysis, you are going to get the negative ions going towards the positive electrode and the positive ions going towards the negative electrode. At the negative electrode, the positive ions are going to pick up electrons At the positive electrode, the negative ions are going to give up electrons. And we can think about our oil rig, oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. In the electrolysis brain, we have a lot going on. So we have sodium chloride solution. Now we are going to have chlorine ions. These are going to go towards the positive electrode and these are going to turn into chlorine gas. Now, because this is a solution, we are going to have hydroxide ions and we are going to have hydrogen ions and we are going to have sodium ions as well. Now the hydrogen ions are going to go towards a positive electrode. These are going to be turned into hydrogen gas. And then we have the um, sodium and the um, hydroxide left over. These are going to turn into sodium hydroxide, which is bleach. For gas calculations, you need to know about Avogadro and his gas constant, which says that one mole is going to have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 particles in it. And that is going to take up 24 decimeters cubed of space. Now, what you need to do is be able to work this out. And to work out the number of moles, we do moles equals 
mass that you have in grams divided by the MR and then you can just take the number of moles and times it by 24. There are loads of practice calculations for this in my chemistry book. In a reversible reaction, you are going to have equilibrium, which means if you do something to the reaction, it is going to counter it to do the opposite. So if the forward reaction is exothermic and you increase the temperature, now because the forward reaction increases the temperature as well, the forward reaction is going to want to decrease the temperature. So an increase in temp is going to favour the reverse reaction, which is endothermic. However, if you decrease the temperature, the reaction is going to want to counter, it's going to want to get hotter, so it's going to favour the forward exothermic reaction. We can do the same with um, numbers. It's going to want to keep the pressure even. So this side we have two moles and this side we have four moles of whatever it is. You can do this just by counting up the number of bits on each side. If you increase the pressure, it is going to favour the side that has the fewer molecules on, so it's going to favour the reverse reaction. However, if you decrease the pressure, it's going to want to counter that, it's going to want to increase the pressure again, so it's going to favour the forward reaction. Now the most common reaction this happens in is the production of ammonia, where we have nitrogen being added to hydrogen and a reversible reaction to make ammonia. Now the important thing to note here is that these are gases and then this is a liquid. And what is going to happen is when the ammonia is made it can be taken off um, at the bottom of the reaction and the nitrogen and the hydrogen can get recycled around again. So there's no waste in this solution. Now, the hard process makes some um, considerations to make the reaction go faster. Because the forward um, reaction is exothermic, the Chatelier's principle would tell us that we need a low temperature. But at a low temperature, we are going to have a low rate of reaction. So they actually have a high temperature to increase the rate of reaction because even though this favours the reverse reaction the increase in the rate of reaction compensates for this and we're also taking ammonia away at the end and because we're taking ammonia away at the end that's going to drive the forward reaction now we are also going to do this at a high pressure You'll notice on this side there are four moles and on this side there are two moles. So a high pressure is going to favour the forward reaction. So you'd think they want as high pressure as possible, but they don't. And the reason they don't is because as you increase the pressure, it gets more dangerous. The, the thicker the walls have to be, the more likely there is a chance of explosion. So they have um, um, a relatively low pressure of around... 200 atmospheres just to make it safe. The temperature they do it at is 450 degrees and both the pressure and the temperature are um, compromises so that we can have a quick and safe reaction. There are two different ways that ethanol can be produced. It can be produced by fermentation where you take um, a sugar crop, you mix it with yeast, and then you are going to get ethanol and carbon dioxide out at the end. Or you can do it by hydration where you get ethene, which is a product of crude oil, remember. It's hydration, so we are adding in water and we are going to get ethanol out at the end. And this is actually a reversible reaction. So you can go from ethene to ethanol and then by dehydration 
you can go from ethanol back to ethene. Now there are some advantages and disadvantages to both of these. Um, obviously coming from crude oil this is non-renewable but it has a hundred percent atom economy. This one over here is renewable but it has a waste product, carbon dioxide. And the other products, um, the other problems with using a sugar crop such as um, sugar cane to produce ethanol is that you are using food that could be feed, um, used to feed starving people and land that could be used to produce food to feed starving people. If we want to harden an oil, if we want to go from something that is unsaturated so it has double bonds to something that is saturated. So it only has single bonds. What we need to do is to add in hydrogen gas. It needs to be done at 60 degrees and you need a nickel catalyst. And what will happen is this double bond here will break and we will get our original um, part of ethene and then the hydrogen will just pop in there hardening or hydrogenating the double bond. Last topic now and it is organic chemistry. We need to know about alcohols, carboxylic acids and esters and the first part of the name the prefix is exactly the same as our organic chemistry back in C1. So meth for one carbon, eth for two carbons, prop for three carbons, but for four carbons, pent for five carbons and hex for six carbons. It's just the ending that's different. In alcohols we need to end them A-N-O-L, anol. And we just need to put that on the end. So if we have this one, which is one, two, three, four carbons, and then an alcohol group on, and we need to make sure we stick to our rules. So carbon makes four bonds, hydrogen makes one bond, and oxygen makes two bonds. This has four carbons, so it is going to be but, and then anyl on the end, or as one of my delightful year 11 stuck his hand straight up and shouted out, but anal. When we get to A level, you'll realise why that joke's actually even funnier when we start naming aldehydes. But this is pronounced butanol, not but anal. Um, you need to be really careful with drawing these because you could give the wrong number of bonds. And remember, we only need one um, alcohol group on here. Now you also need to know the uses and properties of alcohols. Um, alcohols are very good for combustion, for burning things, um, they can also be used for oxidation. But the problems are health problems. Naming carboxylic acids is very, very similar to naming everything else. We just need to make sure we have our carboxylic acid group on at the end here. Everything else is filled up with hydrogens. You'll notice that my oxygens are still making two bonds. This has three carbons, so it is going to be prop, and the ending for this is an oic acid. So this is prop, an oic acid. Now the uses for um, carboxylic acids um, are, oh well not a lot really, it's some um, vinegar because it is just a weak acid and making esters. Now an ester is a carboxylic acid and alcohol mixed together. And the name comes from different places. So the only one that you need to know about for your um, GCSE is ethyl ethanoate. And this gives us the naming of things. So if we just have a look at this, we have 
ethanol. Plus ethanoic acid. And what is going to happen is that these bonds, these bonds here, are going to um, that they're going to react, we're going to lose water, and then we are going to get ethyl ethanoate. And what you'll notice is that the functional group for an ester is this bit in the middle here, and half of it comes from the alcohol, and half of it comes from the carboxylic acid, ethyl ethanoase. Now, just because they um, only want you to know this one, doesn't mean they might be nasty and sneak some other ones in there as well. So, if you've done your revision, if you're feeling really, really comf confident, I've done a whole lot of A-level extension videos, which might be helpful because I've tried to pick out all the tricky, sneaky little areas the examiners might put really hard questions in. Well done, guys. You have made it to the end of the C3 video. If you've made it this far, you're doing fantastic revision and I wish you all the best of luck. Any questions, anything you need to help me with, just pop a comment below and I'll do my very, very best to help you.